I will have people who say to me, that's true, but please don't say it because it's not helpful for my particular politics. Um, I have found in my many interactions with the public over the years that being honest about uncertainties, about the warts, you might say, on science um, builds trust. And I think the climate science community, particularly the physical science community, um, has not well understood that um, for a long time. And there's still people who are out there who see their function as policing the, the debate. Joining me for this video, Roger Pielka Jr. is a prominent political scientist who has been dealing with policy and science issues for several decades. Known for his critiques of extreme climate scenarios and how they are misused, for his work on extreme weather events and whether they are or are not being made worse at the moment by climate change, and generally on his work about the role of scientists advising policy. Professor Pielk, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. I have followed your contributions on a number of areas that we're going to talk about, but for those who are not familiar with your work, how did you get to where you are and what are the themes that tie your work together? Yeah, thanks. Um, I work at the, the, the messy and complicated intersection of science, policy and politics um, across a number of areas now. And I got to that spot. Um, I grew up uh, in the household of educators. Um, my mom was an elementary school teacher and my father's a prominent atmospheric scientist. Um, I always thought I was going to be a physical scientist. Um, and I had a chance to go to Washington, D.C. And, and, and work on the staff of the House Science Committee uh, along the way while I was in grad school. And I got to observe scientists and policymakers grappling with communicating and trying to make decisions. And for me, that was a, the aha moment that, you know, this is where I want to work, uh, where, where science and policy meet. Let's start there then, because, I mean, We've come through two remarkable years with COVID, where we have seen science and policy intermingling in a much more direct way in terms of you know, everyday people's lives than we were ever used to in the past. What's your assessment with how we come out of that period? What's the, what, how do you think the reputation of science and scientists stands today as a sort of key input into public policy? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a great question. We could, we could talk for a long time on that. I've led a, a research project for the last two years, um, looking at science advice in governments uh, around the world. We have 20 case studies. And, and the answer is that it's mixed. Um, in, in some instances, um, science has done fantastic. And obviously, the, the rapid development of the vaccines and the rollout is a huge success story. Um, at the same time, in many contexts, uh, in the UK, in the US, um, elsewhere, um, the, the advice provided, the integration of expertise and decision-making um, offers a lot of lessons for how we can do better in the future. Um, it, from very simple things like, like just basic data collection. Um, where is the disease? Who has the disease? Who's in the hospital? Where? Um, particularly in, in larger countries that have um, devolved governance to states or to regions, to cities, um, we've learned that collecting just basic data and assembling it for decision makers can be very difficult. Um, at the same time, um, dealing with uncertainty, new knowledge, areas of ignorance has shown that, um, that, that again, we can do better um, in, in how we assemble knowledge and present it to decision makers. And I guess a third big lesson is that experts need to do better integrating knowledge. So the big fault line really worldwide in the pandemic was between public health and economics. Um, people want their jobs to continue. They want to go to work. They want to get paid. Um, and advice in many places was focused narrowly on public health. And it was left to decision makers to do that really difficult task of, well, how do we integrate public health with considerations about economics in the form of policy options? So I see that, um, you know, there's a lot of opportunity to draw some lessons. And the pandemic's not over, obviously. And so, you know, these lessons are going to be immediately important. I suppose one of the, one of the interesting areas is, how much we became focused on what seemed to be a single variable problem, the variable variable being the spread of COVID, where even if you were talking specifically about public health, the costs of lockdown to public health, the cost to people who would otherwise have had cancer scans and treatments and so on and so forth, was never factored into the advice that was given that we have records of and certainly not factored into how the science was communicated to the public. It's not in the UK and not from what I've seen in the US. And, and this, 
tendency for this um, the stream of science communication to focus the public attention on a single variable seemed to me to be part of a problem. Does, does that does that accord with how you would see it as well, or am I off base there? No, I don't think you're off base. I think, I mean, in the UK, very early on, you know, the, the phrase "follow the science" was was quite popular. Um, the, the 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 group that uh, formed of experts outside government, um, independent sage, uh, they adopted you know following the science as their tagline. Um, in the United States, um, President Biden in particular um, has made a big emphasis on following the science. And, and I guess the thing to understand is that science doesn't lead anywhere. Science is really a valuable way of knowing the world and, and the different areas of science can provide information that is uh, supportive and useful in making policy. But the thing to, to understand is that what people in government, in the public wanna know are, are options. You know, what can we do? What should we do with what outcomes? How can we make things better? So the idea that a single number or a set of numbers or science in general um, provides a, a leadership or a guide to where we want to go, uh, that was always misplaced. And so, uh, you know, what, what's needed in a complex, evolving, short-term situation is the ability to, to take action, evaluate the consequences of that action, and correct course if needed. And uh, I think the idea that science advice is something separate from policy advice or policy options um, is always going to get us in trouble because science as we've seen in the pandemic, the same body of science can be invoked to support a wide range of conflicting policies. It doesn't, it doesn't resolve political disputes. So I think that's one of the things that has come out of the pandemic is the need to more clearly focus on the justifications for policy decisions that are taken, but also understanding, well, how, what's the consequence? How well are we doing? Um, if it's a lockdown, if it's not a lockdown, if it's masking, not masking, um, people need to know what are the consequences of these alternative courses of action. I think this is a theme we'll touch on again uh, later on. In the meantime, I suppose then what we're interested in is the quality of scientific advice and that it's appropriate. And Pre President Biden has just appointed not one, but two scientific advisors, uh, really, in the last few days. What then do you feel should be the role of that post going forward? And, and has it changed in the light of what's happened over the last couple of years. Yeah, there's this idea, and it's, <clears throat> excuse me, it's part of the mythology of uh, science advice, that, that the science advisor in the United States, or whether, you know, chief scientific advisor in, in the UK setting, but there's, there's uh, and it's almost invariably has always been a man, but there's some wise man who stands behind the, the, the president or the prime minister, whispers in his or her ear um, with, with advice. You know, you should do this, you should do that. And it, it really doesn't work that way. Um, in the United States, for example, um, there are literally thousands of experts on advisory committees of the federal government. We, we have an embarrassing, rich uh, ecosystem of expertise and advice. So the idea that there's a scientific advisor that carries undue weight, historically, it's, it's been more myth than, than reality. Um, the, the new advisor, and, and President Biden for the first time um, since the position was created in 1957, has split the position. So we have that uh, Alondra Nelson is the head of the Office of Science and Technology Policy, which in general does policy for science. And then Francis Collins, uh, who recently retired as the head of the National Institutes of Health, was put in as a, what's called a special assistant to the president um, for, for science and technology. And his job is the quote unquote science advisor. Obviously his expertise is in the biomedical fields. So he won't be giving uh, advice on artificial intelligence, on defense issues, on space issues. Um, and so it's a very narrow set of advice. The United States is, is pretty unique among countries that the United States does not have a high level science advisory mechanism or body for the pandemic, um, which in my view is a gross oversight. Um, so it's not clear exactly what the portfolio will be for Francis Collins, a brand new position. Um, President Biden also has uh, Anthony Fauci, who's uh, the government's chief chief medical um, advisor, which is a position that's only about two years old, was created under Donald Trump. So it's it's pretty unclear exactly what form and how advice that it, uh, uses science is is taking place in the Biden administration. So um, I do think it's a, an important experiment in splitting these two positions, and we're going to have to watch it pretty closely. Yes, this talking about 
the climate change area, which is the other... I mean, if there are two big areas where policy and science are overlapping uh, both now and into the near future, clearly climate change is the other one. And it's one, obviously, where you've made your name. And before we talk about your work in that area, in the UK, we have broadly every main political party is signed up to action on climate change, is signed up to a net zero policy target of one sort or another. In the US, of course, it is deeply divided on party lines. How, as a close observer who's focused on science and policy, how did America get party politically divided on climate change? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I'm old enough to remember when uh, George H.W. Bush, uh, running for president in 1988 uh, said he was going to counter the greenhouse effect with the White House effect, um, and and the the environment uh, in general and climate change in particular um, weren't always uh, a wedge issue in the United States context. Um, and and my view as a you know speaking as a political scientist is that that really it it took both Republicans and Democrats seeing the climate issue as offering political advantage such that both sides wanted it politicized. Um, it's not just that you know, Republicans refused the science or, or Democrats ran with the climate issue. It's that both sides decided, hey, here's one where we can energize our base, our voters. And so you really saw um, into the, it, probably around 2000, um, I mean, it, it was always kind of a split in the 1990s, but, but really with the administration of um, George W. Bush following the Kyoto Protocol. Um, and it, I should say the Kyoto Protocol um, there was a vote in the U.S. Senate, and it was unanimous. Democrats and Republicans opposed it. So, so <laughs> the the idea that um, climate has always been a wedge issue in the United States just that's, that's not correct. But um, it's really been a product of the last twenty years. And uh, you know, to this day, um, you know, President Obama signed on to the Paris Agreement. Donald Trump pulled the U.S. out. Um, President Biden rejoined. It is very much a partisan issue, not not so much a policy issue these days. How much of that followed? the rise of Al Gore as a key spokesperson and obviously as a partisan figure, did, did that have some influence in that sort of polarising effect or was it already well underway by the time he became a, a, a key figure and spokesperson for the issue? Yeah, I think both is the answer. I mean, yes, obviously, if you have a leading uh, presidential candidate for one party um, espousing a particular platform, um, it makes it a convenient target for the other side. Um, and then you know, after the 2000 election, um, leading up to Al Gore's documentary, An Inconvenient Truth, um, he was he was fairly visible and a very partisan, divisive figure. And so there's no doubt that that contributed. I don't think that's the entire explanation, but that certainly contributed um, to the issue. And as the U.S. Congress has become more extreme um, through complicated reasons like, like redistricting in the primary process, um, many in Congress are not reflective of broader... Um, views in society. If you look at opinion polls, um, climate change is a is overall a pretty popular issue across the electorate. Of course, Democrats are more in favor, but Republicans still, um, they're not as, as strongly in favor as Democrats, but there's a, a large uh, proportion of Republicans who think climate is important. So, you know, Congress focusing attention, going after scientists and so on, uh, just added fuel to the fire in the 2000s and, and got us to where we are today. Um, right now, I don't think um, I don't think climate policies that are put in the context of jobs, of economic growth, and so on would be particularly controversial in the U.S. They're probably more controversial in Congress than they are more broadly in the country. Yeah, I suppose the challenge is where you get them attached to large spending bills, and given where we are in economic sort of terms and the state of the debate between the parties and the delicate balance within the House, then that's always going to be where the rubber meets the road. One of the areas where you've made your name was looking at whether, looking at whether extreme weather events were increasing because of climate change. Right now, the UK is being battered by a succession of named storms, which naturally is leading various commentators to simply point and say, look, that means climate change, doesn't it? Which by and large, as far as we know, it doesn't. But that's what people will intuitively think. 
And of course, in the US, uh, you have similar dynamics with campaigners and politicians taking an intuitive take always that whenever there's some bad weather, that e- definitely equals climate change. What from the work that you've done uh, is the picture as you understand it? Yeah, um, the first thing to understand is that that the category of extreme weather um, isn't particularly helpful from a scientific perspective. Uh, we have to go phenomena by phenomenon. So if you're looking at extra tropical storms, tropical cyclones, floods, drought, extreme high temperatures, extreme low temperatures, um, you really need to look at the data case by case. I started working on uh, extreme weather phenomena as a, as a postdoctoral research assistant um, at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in 1994. And this was really before extreme weather events and climate um, really got, got linked up together. And you know, the good news is we have a lot of data worldwide on trends in extreme weather phenomena across the board. Um, in, in some places it's better than others, but it allows us to have a longer term perspective on uh, the frequency and intensity of events. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, um, does periodic assessment reports, um, as do a number of other agencies. And they've been very consistent over the years in what they report on where we see extreme weather phenomena uh, increasing or decreasing. And there's there's really uh, only a couple areas where uh, there's a documented increase that has been attributed to the emission of greenhouse gases. That's, that's uh, extreme heat, heat waves um, has increased, um, what's called extreme precipitation. And the IPCC goes to great lengths to explain just because precipitation has increased doesn't mean that flooding has increased. Um, you could have a you know, two inches of rain in, in October in, in Boulder, Colorado, where I live, that would be a very extreme, rare weather event, but it's not going to cause any flooding. So you have to distinguish extreme precipitation from flooding. Um, also, several forms of drought, um, ecological drought um, is one that the IPCC has, has found an increase in, which again, is not the same as what's called hydrological water or meteorological uh, weather drought. And there also has been an increase in what's called fire weather. So these are the weather conditions that lead to um, that make fire more likely. Um, it's not fire itself, um, although there are some places like the Western United States where I live there, where there has been an increase. Um, but for, for a lot of the, I guess, the headline phenomena, hurricanes, which are called tropical cyclones more generally, um, f- flooding, um, which is also, you know, we see on the news a lot, um, overall drought, um, tornadoes, there has not been a documented increase. So, you know, I, I understand the, the, the lay person's um, quick attribution of this or that weather event, and that's fine. And, you know, the, the media needs to sell newspapers. Um, but for those who really want to know what the data says, it's out there. And, you know, what's happened in the past is not the same as what's projected for the future. Um, but, you know, if you're, if you're planning, um, you know, you're, you're, you're doing emergency planning in a community um, or you're building a dam or, or some other engineering project, you're going to want to have good information. Uh, the insurance industry has great information on this and generally understands, you know, where there's trends, where there's not trends. Um, so there is, a, I think there is a slight difference between, you know, what you find in public discourse and what you find in the scientific literature. And, uh, you know, for me, sticking to what the science says is always pretty important. Yes. What do you think of the moves that there have been recently to start to have a, a rapid attribution process for individual events, which I have seen some of the scientists who are actually involved with that evolving process have described as might be useful in attributing blame, shall we say, you know, for corporate, corporate responsibility for climate change being then uh, put on to damages that are caused by individual events whether or not that part of it actually um, is feasible or desirable. What's your perception of the science behind that sort of evolving trend that we see? Yeah, that's, I mean, so, so to understand the, the, the event attribution, you, know, you have to take a step back. And the way the IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, both detects climate change and then attributes it to a human cause, um, it uses a long-term record, which it says, you know, 30 to 50 years or longer. And if you if you see a trend in a phenomenon, so let's say we see more hurricanes over 50 years, it's, the trend is up. Then the next question is, well, why is that happening? Can we attribute it? And it takes a very long 
time series. That's traditionally how detection and attribution have been done. In recent years, um, I think partly out of my frustration that there hasn't been long-term trends in, in many phenomena, um, a new methodology was developed where you take a computer model and you run it without human greenhouse gases and you look at the, the output in terms of, let's say, tropical cyclones or, or flooding in a particular region. Then you rerun that same model, and, but this time you include greenhouse gases and you see the, the, the trends in the model for that particular phenomena. You compare the two and then the difference, you say, well, that's due to human caused climate change. So if in that difference you say, oh, there's more floods, um, then you can attribute you know, the flood in the UK or the flood in Cologne or the flood in uh, China um, to greenhouse gases. Um, the, the creators of that method have variously said, well, you know, we wanna do this so that we can get into the media. Um, peer review is too slow and we wanna support, as you suggest, we wanna support lawsuits against fossil fuel companies. Um, I think it's a very, I think it's interesting and it's scientifically, you know, fun and it satisfies curiosity. It's going to be, I think, a very difficult um, step to make that um, sufficiently robust so as to be admissible in a court or to be convincing to a lot of scientists because we have a lot of models <laughs> and we have a lot of assumptions that go into them. And it's quite possible that, and we've seen this, that, that different methodological choices will lead to different outcomes. You know, was that event attributed? Was it not attributed? Um, and then there's the, the logical challenge. What does it mean if you attribute a flood in the UK to climate change, but over the long term, there's no increase in flooding? So if, if risk has gone up and you're making an argument risk has gone up, then we should at some point be able to detect uh, that increased risk in the long term trends. So all that is to say, um, I think the IPCC approach, um, the longstanding approach to detection and attribution uh, is a much more robust evidence-based um, grounding for thinking about detection and attribution. Um, although scientists you know, will debate this going forward. Let's talk about the climate scenarios side. So I've talked to several times on this channel about the extreme climate scenario and how it gets used and misused, drawing from the commentary that, that you've put out there uh, very much interested in how all of that discussion has been developing. But for those who might be watching this video and haven't really seen any of that material that I've covered in the past, what are the scenarios that you've been talking about and why is it a point of interest in terms of policy? Yeah, I mean, this is a, a, a fascinating topic and it's really um, behind the curtain in, in climate research, so to speak. Um, the reality is in order to understand the future and how, how we're going to go into the future, we need to have scenarios of, of how that future might evolve. Um, we have proven over and over again that um, prediction of how a complicated society and a climate that depends in, in, in no small part on that society, how it behaves, prediction is really not in the cards for us. Um, so what we do is we generate scenarios of what are called plausible futures. These are futures that could happen. And the whole point of policy is to steer steer society into preferred directions over not preferred directions. And of course we argue over where we wanna go and that's politics, but scenarios are key to that. So going back to the beginning of climate research to the very early years of the IPCC, the work looking to the future was always grounded in scenarios. Um, and the, what most people don't appreciate is the scenarios that inform current policy were all developed 2005 to 2010 or earlier. And, and by scenarios here, we're talking about if humankind emits X amount of emissions, then this is roughly what will happen. But if, on the other hand, it only emits so many fewer emissions, then something different will happen. It's that those are the sort of variables in those scenarios. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And 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 you know, the fundamental building blocks of a scenario, and I'm glad you you raised this, are the economy. So, <laughs> what what are we going to be doing economically? Um, the population, how many people are going to be on the planet? Um, what kind of energy are we going to uh, use? What are the sources of energy? And what are we going to put that energy to use doing? Are we going to be in finance? Are we going to be Bitcoin mining? Are we going to be, um, you, you know, building steel, concrete? So, so all of those variables, and people can understand why it's so hard to predict the future, because 
I mean, if you if you knew what the economy was going to do, you'd, you'd be wealthy on a beach somewhere. Um, so it's it's complicated. So we use these scenarios, and the ones that are currently used in science and policy are 10, 15, 20 years old. And it, it should be a surprise to no one that as we move into the future, um, our knowledge of, uh, of scenarios advances. And some futures that we used to think were plausible no longer appear plausible. The analogy I use, um, if you were studying um, the Soviet Union in 1985, um, you might have long-term scenarios for the Soviet Union to exist into the 21st century and so on. If it's 1995 and you're still studying scenarios of the future of the Soviet Union, you're out of date. And so it's very similar with climate scenarios. It turns out that the current generation of scenarios, and, there, and let me say, there's thousands of scenarios out there. It's an enormous field. A lot of good work is done. But to run a climate model, you need to you need to pick and choose because you can't, it's a computationally intensive. Um, it takes a lot of work. So you need to reduce the thousands of scenarios that you might find out there to just a few. And so about 10, 15 years ago, um, the climate community decided, all right, we're going to focus on four scenarios. We're going to have a high one, a low one, and two in the middle um, for how emissions might uh, grow going into the future. And it turns out that the high scenario was, was labeled in the, the paper that, that, uh, that, that presented it for the first time as a quote unquote business as usual scenario. This is where we're headed. This is our future, um, unless we change course. And that, that idea that um, that was our most likely future or the direction we were heading um, really has been part of the climate discourse for years. One thing we've learned in, in recent years is we're not following that scenario. Things, things actually look a lot better. I mean, climate change is real. We have to take a lot of action to get off of fossil fuels. It's no, no easy feat, but we no longer envision a future of uh, unstopped, rapidly increasing emissions all the way to the end of the century. So that's good news. The bad news is most of our research and policy discourse and what you find in the assessments of the IPCC depend upon the most extreme scenario. And that is, uh, at a minimum, it's out of date. Um, <laughs> worse, it's, it could be misleading for, for policymaking. So the scenarios are in dire need of being updated to inform um, today's policymakers, to inform the public today, because it's a little bit like um, you know, driving into our climate future, looking into the rearview mirror. The, the information is, is, is dated and it's from the past and, and we can and should do better. The way that this leaks out into the wider discourse, I suppose, is because of that extreme top end scenario, which we know to be RCP 8.5 as, as was, that tends to drive news headlines. And in a world now where we have growing levels of eco-anxiety amongst young people and we have the emergence of the more extreme end of the climate campaigners whose core message is the world is ending on an imminent timescale. And those headlines don't exactly make it easier to have that discussion, let's put it that way. And I've, I've seen you know some of the debate, obviously, between yourself and some of the climate science community who, who might defend the frequent use of RCP 8.5. And it seems to me to be this disconnect between the scientific community that sees it in terms of the research that is being done, and, and clearly that's your focus as well, but also really the real world consequences of how this is shaping the understanding of the issue and the discourse about the issue, and some arguably some real damage that is being done to our ability to respond sensibly to this as, as a result. Is that an overreaction or is that broadly in line with the sort of message that you've been putting out? No, no, I think that's, that's completely fair. And let, and let me say, there are perfectly legitimate reasons why a climate scientist who's doing physical science modeling might want to use a very extreme scenario. Um, you know, imagine if someone says, I want to study what would happen if a 10 kilometer um, asteroid were to come and strike the earth in the ocean, right? And I'm going to do a computer model and just, just explore what would happen. That's a very different proposition than saying a 10 kilometer asteroid could conceivably hit the earth um, in the next 10 years. Um, there is some confusion over doing research that's exploratory versus doing what's called projective research, 
outlining a plausible future. And things are really complicated because um, university, I work at a university. The university press office likes to put out press releases on stories that are likely to get media attention. The more lurid, the more extreme, um, obviously, the more interesting to today's media, many elements of it. And um, a story that you know, drought may increase by 2% in 100 years is not as newsworthy as a story that drought may increase by 60% in 100 years. Funding, um, publication, citation. Um, if I'm working on a research project and I'm using this extreme scenario, RCP 8.5, and, and I've been working on it for five years, and someone shows up and says, oh yeah, that's out of date. It's no longer relevant. It's a very hard proposition to swallow for a researcher who has a lot tied up in it. So you, the whole community has a lot tied up into it. Then you put the overlay of uh, the politics of climate change, which like many environmental issues, some of the more, um, I would say, vocal activists like the idea, whether they believe it or not, but they like the idea of a future apocalypse to, to motivate people today. And so if you say, well, actually, climate change is bad, but it's not the end of the world, that undercuts that advocacy message. And so, so I think there's a lot of dynamics inside science, inside the research community, but also with the overlay of the hot politics of climate change that, that make it difficult to, uh, for, you know, science, one thing science does really well is it self-corrects. Um, that's the idea. We use evidence, we use argument, and if we go down a wrong path, we can fix it. Um, but in this case, it's taking longer than it should because of all of the pressures and dynamics. Um, but I, I can assure you, um, many people are fully aware of the issues with scenarios. And it's just, you know, when are we going to correct course is the only question left today. How much does that political dynamic start to infect the scientific community? I mean, if you look at both with covid for pandemic and with climate change we've we've got two issues that are huge and they require a resp or, or, or they believe that they respire they require a response from the public either to socially distance and to do various other things or in the case of climate change potentially at least to alter certain behaviors some people think that we should be eating less meat some people think that we shouldn't be flying Whatever it is, various people have got various opinions on what should happen, but it goes into how people live their lives. And so what you start to see is both from media and from some of the more, shall we say, campaigning scientists, the emergence of a campaign voice and, and people asking themselves, not just is this true, but also is this helpful? So you've said some things on the basis that they were true in relation to, for instance, ex extreme weather uh, uh, frequency. And some people might have felt, well, what he's saying is true, but the way he's saying it, the way he's framing it is not helpful. And it seems to me that not helpful part comes from requiring a campaign framing of how these things are talked about. How much of that is actually influencing the scientific community or is that all purely happening in the public space with the media and the politics? Yeah, there's a lot there to unpack. The, the first thing I would say is, is advocacy for you know, political ends, whatever your policy preferences are, is a noble part of democratic societies. So scientists are citizens. They should have every right, just like everybody else, to go out on the street corner, stand on a box and, and, and tell, tell their vision of the world as they see it. Um, but I think you hit on the key element there. It's when the politics of these issues um, emerges within the scientific community that I think there's some, some risks. So I've seen efforts to um, silence people inside of academia, um, to discredit people, to delegitimize kind of, I don't know what the, the right metaphor, working the referee is what we would say on a football pitch. Um, and, and I think that is problematic because science has for, as an institution, science has enjoyed enormous public support, um, really most places around the world for a long time. Um, and it's, it's traditionally spanned the political spectrum. And um, we are seeing some signs on particular issues, COVID, medical science is one, climate is another. Um, we see this in energy also, but that people start losing trust in 
scientists and the institutions of science um, when it becomes hyper-politicized. Um, there's some good recent research that, that finds that the public supports science and the institutions of science more when it's perceived to be independent uh, from partisan politics. So I do think that um, it's fine for scientists to be very political, to be open, to call for action, but when they bring those politics back into the academy, so to speak, or in the IPCC or whatever, um, that's a risk because then, then you're threatening the overall legitimacy of the enterprise um, and you're, you're bringing, instead of bringing science into politics, which I think everyone supports, you're bringing politics back into science, which I think carries with it some risks. I was having a conversation with another researcher talking about contrarian arguments and a study that had been done about what were the main contrarian arguments being put out by climate skeptic blogs and the like. And he used the phrase that they were moving from what he called science denial to what he then referred to as policy denial, which I have to say starts to raise a few, well, interesting questions, shall we say, because obviously policy denial, you can't treat that in, in, as, as, in the same way as a concept of science denial, because politics, you're allowed to have whatever ideas you want, and including stupid ones, and that is resolved through democratic debate and you know, the whole process of how all of that works. Applying the, the principle of science denial onto policy seemed to me to be a potentially dodgy area that the climate science community might be drifting towards. I don't know. What's your perception of that? Have you seen that? Yeah, I guess. I mean, my view is that that the whole notion of science denial, which we could talk about uh, and, and unpack that concept, but it's always been a political term. It's And, and, and you know, I, I also have heard the phrase policy denial or you know, people who, the, the latest I saw just, you know, last week is people who reject the idea of net zero CO2 um, are science deniers because they don't sign on to that particular policy. And, you know, the, the reality is um, that the whole idea of science denial as a label on someone um, it evokes the, the whole concept of what's called um, the deficit model of, of science. That if only people knew the science accurately and truly, then they would support my policy preferences. And so if we can just silence the, den the deniers, get rid of them, remove them from the playing field, then the people who speak the truth will be heard and then everyone will come around to the same politics. And, and that's, that's just not how things work. I don't tend to get too worked up about um, contrarian or skeptic arguments um, for the simple reason is that climate science is really robust. And if people want to, to, to challenge and question it, I think that's great because that's how you build trust is to allow issues to be explored. And are there cynical people out there who will try to exploit uncertainties? And so on? Of course there are. It's, it's not unique to the climate issue. Welcome to politics. So um, I, I am happy to engage with people across the political spectrum with different scientific views and have a conversation representing here's what the science says as i understand it and if someone has a different view that's fine ultimately the, the the goal of politics is not to get everybody to think the same way it's to get people who think in different ways to act in unison and people can come to support action like you say in the uk uh, across the political parties there's so strong support for action on climate change now within that there's a considerable disagreement over what that action might entail but that's politics and um so I'm not, I'm not too bothered by skeptics or contrarians. I, I know that gets me in trouble sometimes because that's you know, one of the main fault lines the scientific community has decided to fight on. Um, I'd much rather fight over policy alternatives than, than what people choose to believe or not to believe in, in climate science. Has the climate science community been battered into a position of being too closed to critical voices? Obviously, the sort of critiques that you put forward have often been responded to with the same degree of hostility from some in the climate science community, let's say, as anyone else that they would identify as being a contrarian in, in whatever language they would choose to use. And when you look now at the people who are raising various questions, I mean, I have opinions about some of them, the, 
the Lomborgs and so on, who who you can certainly criticise, but they're asking interesting questions, if nothing else. It seems to me that there are no critics now, raise, people raising critical questions, who are taken as doing so on good faith, who are engaged in discussion in that spirit. It's like you're either in the community or else you are on the other side. And of course, we're talking about a subset of highly visible campaigning scientists. I mean, the, the majority of the community are people who got their heads down doing research and probably see some of this going on, but don't take part in it. Nevertheless, has the, has the discourse been polluted by that early experience when scientists were extremely strongly under attack by arguably vested interest? And that's made them less inclined to be open to genuine good faith critique. Yeah, it's a really interesting question. And in, in one comment you, you said in there, I want to amplify. The climate science community is in an enormous, sprawling, interdisciplinary group. And there is this subset. And I, I mean, it's an important subset because they're highly visible and they're very powerful in the community, but also in the institutions uh, of the community. So like journals or professional associations, or universities that are more active in campaigning. Early on, and it goes back to, I think, you know, the, 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 the early days of social media blogging and so on, um, the, the, the most prominent voices in climate science decided that policing the debate of their important functions. So, so eliminating uh, unwelcome voices, eliminating critique. I work in a field that studies science and um, <laughs> scholars in my area have been critical of many areas of science, how it's conducted and so on for a long time. That's, that's what, you know, doctors study sick people and policy scholars study uh, pathological policies. <laughs> At some point, the view was, and this was reinforced in the media and in politics, that climate science was too important to be critiqued. And so if, you know, when I publish critiques of the scenarios, it's really good science, it's peer reviewed, stands up to scrutiny, but if it's viewed as not helpful or someone on that doesn't share my politics might invoke it, then I must be as bad as them because I'm doing that research. Um, I have a very different view. I think science gets better when we subject it to scrutiny and we ask hard questions and we do the research. Is it uncomfortable? Yeah, it's really uncomfortable. Um, and sometimes do we have to change course? Yes. Um, and sometimes, for example, if I say, well, the number, and the frequency and intensity of hurricanes hitting the United States has not increased over the last century. Factually true, it's in the IPCC. I will have people who say to me, that's true, but please don't say it because it's not helpful for my particular politics. Um, I have found in my many interactions with the public over the years that being honest about uncertainties, about the warts, you might say, on science, um, builds trust. It doesn't subtract from trust because people know that science is a human enterprise and not everything is neatly tied up with a bow on top. So I find that being ruthlessly and rigorously honest about the science actually lends itself to building support across people who might be skeptical. Um, and I think the climate science community, particularly the physical science community, um, has not well understood that um, for a long time. And there's still people who are out there who see their function as policing the, the debate. Um, it's hard to do. <laughs> uh, I would say it's impossible to do today because you have people like I'm a tenured full professor and you know I have my job at a big forum. So um, they can say mean things about me, but you know they don't say too much about my research. So that's that's all fine. Yes. And of course, we also see the discussion spilling over into public forums. Now, I, you've been aware, I know, of the toing and froing with the Joe Rogan uh, setup where they had different climate voices that have been put on there and Andrew Dessler was put on as the the, the token climate uh, mainstream scientist to, to respond to some of the things that have gone before. I think you saw that video. You, you probably didn't see some of the ones that went before. What's your sense from that of the current state of the public debate, if one could call it that. Yeah, I, and I have to admit, I mean, this shows you how how detached I am. I, I was only vaguely aware of Joe Rogan um, until the, the the COVID controversy. And I mean, I think it's really important for people to understand that 
that, that, all right, Joe Rogan has this huge platform. He has all these listeners and the extended pressure that was put upon him has led him to diversify the sorts of voices and change his behavior. And so rather than remove him or, you know, get him off of Spotify or take him out, um, using political, social, economic pressure on him to diversify his voices means that now a greater diversity of people will appear on his show and his listeners will get a, a more nuanced view of the world, which is great. I think having Andrew Dessler on um, was fantastic. I mean, good. I want people to listen to Andrew Dessler. Listen to what he says, evaluate it, put it up next to Steve Coonan and listen to him also. Um, we're all better for that diversity of voices. So, so I do think the controversy um, over Joe Rogan has, has illustrated a few things. Um, and for me, it just reinforces the idea that in democratic societies, um, we want people to be exposed to ideas, even, even if they're not always you know, the, the consensus or the mainstream, because our job as, as, and I'll speak as an expert, our job as experts is not to get everybody to think alike. That's, that's, that's not in my, my job description. Do we remember that? I mean, has, has COVID and latterly climate pushed us towards this belief that says, well, actually, no, you are expected to think the same? In, in all important respects, you know, you, you, you might decide that you think the, the economy should be run differently. But when it comes to these key issues, which are going to become increasingly important issues, then you are expected to have one view only. And that involves policy choices. It must involve, I don't know, carbon taxes or whatever. It does feel as though there is that element of, of focus that sort of, you know, lining up with what you've said before, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, I do think... Um there, there is a, a view among many prominent sign across fields, and it's not just um, climate or it's not just COVID, that, that the way to political success for whatever your preference is, is through educating people about science. And, and I've seen really over the last 20 years, the rise of a, a subfield called science communication. And the idea, and in, in not always, and not everywhere, but in many cases, the idea, go out, preach your science, and that will convert people to your cause. And um, politics is, is, is much more complicated, nuanced, subtle than that. And I guess my concern, I mean, I don't think those strategies are, are you know, necessarily going to change politics or they're pathological out in the real world. They're probably just going to be ignored. Uh, it runs more risk of bringing politics into the academy than, than the other way around. So um, yes, everyone should be a good communicator, but I, think about it, we don't have history communication. We don't have economics communication. Um, and the idea that science communication is some special thing, um, I think that's what sets us down the wrong path, the idea that everyone needs to understand science in the same way. We don't hear those arguments where, you know, everyone needs to understand microeconomics in the exact same way so we can, you know, so the central banks can operate. That's It, it just it doesn't even make sense to even talk like that in yeah, this context. Yeah. Roger, it's been a fascinating discussion. I understand that you have a book currently in production. What What is that and what stage is it at? I am trying to sell a book proposal that would be uh, the sequel to my 2011 book, The Climate Fix. Um, and it's called Our Bright Future, How We Solved Climate Change. And the idea is to put a optimistic, not Panglossian, but optimistic view on where we're at and how we're going to get to a, a much better future, um, which I think is, um, is is quite possible. So it's an antidote to the apocalypse narratives that are out there. That seems sorely needed. And if people want to find you and follow your work, where can they do so on social media? Yeah, they can find me on Twitter, Roger Pelkey Jr. Um, and they can also search Pelkey and Substack. And I've been writing a couple times a week, uh, uh, newsletter slash blog on all sorts of topics in science and policy. Brilliant. Thank you so much for your time. It's been a really, really interesting discussion. And I encourage people to follow up and to uh, seek you out on social media and hopefully, fingers crossed, for that book. Thanks, Malin. Good to be with you. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, please share with anyone else you think would also enjoy it. Word of mouth is really important to us. And if you've not subscribed yet, what are you waiting for? As the saying goes, that subscribe button won't smash itself. So.